Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be with you all here today um, for this OHBM symposium and to talk about network control theory. I'd like to ask the question of what network control theory is, uh, ask the question of whether it's useful, and then if it is, for what? So first, what is network control theory? So network control theory is a mathematical framework that determines which perturbations can drive the entire system to a desired state. It's typically applied to the study of the power grid, mechanical systems, air traffic control systems, and robotics. Um, so here's an example of a little network of four different nodes where inputs you are placed inside a particular node to drive the activity of the rest of the system. And here's an example of what that might look like in a state space where the initial state, state may be at the origin and the final state driven by you may be somewhere else. Now, how would we take this idea and apply it to neural systems? Well, first, what we would do is define a trajectory of a neural system to be the temporal path that the system traverses through diverse states, where a state is defined as the magnitude of neurophysiological activity across brain regions at a single time point. So, for example, a single TR in fMRI data or a single um, time point in, in some other kind of imaging technique. Then once that is um, set up, the controllability of the network refers to the possibility to manipulate network components to drive the system along a desired trajectory that is a set of states that culminate in a target state, which is often chosen for its functional utility, either in terms of task performance or in terms of healthy dynamics. Now, how does control theory differ from communication models? Well, first, they differ in their goals. So the goal of communication models is to capture the evolution of communication dynamics by using dynamical models, and then to characterize the process of signal propagation using graph theoretical and statistical measures. In contrast, the goal of control theory is to determine the control strategies that would navigate the system from some initial state to some final target state. So what are the inputs and the outputs of network control theory? Well, first, there are two different inputs to network control theory. The first is a map of the network. And so that would be a connectome or some sort of graph um, or some representation of the network that exists in the system. The second input is a model of dynamics. And we'll talk about different models of dynamics in a second. <clears throat> the outputs of the theory are a perturbation that has been designed to allow for some particular outcome. So let's talk about these three pieces in turn. First, the mapping of the network. So in a human, we would typically use diffusion tractography to map out the structural connectome in a human and use that as one of the inputs to network control theory. We could instead, however, also use track tracing in the macaque or mouse or um, EM in cellular level circuits. What are some advantages and disadvantages of different network maps? Well, first, I said that the common one would be structural connectivity. That has the advantage of allowing to model physical propagation of signals along white matter tracks. But it also has two disadvantages. One disadvantage is that it does not allow for propagation through local tissue where a white matter track has not been defined. So for example, when you have two gray matter gray matter areas that are next to one another and a single could flow signal could flow through the tissue, um, the structural connectivity may not show that connectivity. So one solution to that problem is to use what's called a touching matrix, which reflects the physical abutment of gray matter areas. And we've done that most recently in Carr et al. in a Journal of Neuroengineering paper. A second disadvantage of structural connectivity is that some states of the brain may privilege the flow of information along some tracks more than others, or in some directions more than others. And a solution to this disadvantage is to instead use effective connectivity matri matrices rather than structural connectivity. Um, though, of course, acknowledging that those effective connectivity matrices will only be as useful as they are well estimated. This is something that we have done recently in Scheid et al. 2021 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences. I'll also note um, that multi-layer networks can be used to study control as well. So we could move beyond a single network and study multi-layer networks for the control of neurovascular systems, for example. 
Now let's turn to the second input. I told you there were two inputs, a map of the network and a model of dynamics. So let's focus on the model of dynamics for a second. So first, the simplest model that we could use is a linear model. Um, that's also time invariant. And here's an example of what that would be, where X of T is the state of the system, A is an adjacency matrix, which could be the structural connectivity matrix, X of T is the state of the brain at time T. And then here's the control. U of T is the input injected into the system, and then B is the um, is a matrix that indicates which regions have uh, input being injected into them. We could also move to linear time varying models. So here you have the adjacency matrix also being a function of time. That's particularly useful when you're studying effective connectivity matrices, where you may have different estimates of effective connectivity um, as a task is being performed or as an individual is moving through uh, different dynamical regimes, for example, during a seizure. And then adding even more complexity, we can go to fully nonlinear models. But in each of these cases, what we can do is estimate what U of T is needed to allow for a particular um, state transition or set of, set of state transitions. And once we've uh, identified what that U is, then we can um, compute a, a uh, energy associated with that change. And we do that by um, suggesting that the cost of control or the energy required for control scales quadratically with the input U. Um, so that allows us to, to assess the, the energy required for these state transitions. Now, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of these dynamical models? Well, first, let's start with the linear time invariant model, the very simplest one. This is nice because it's simple enough to provide analytical intuitions. You can actually derive things quite easily about it. Um, it's been extensively developed uh, uh, in terms of its machinery or the methodology and tools available for many different control strategies. Or there, are, there are lots of approaches that can be pulled from engineering into neuroscience. Um, and it's a first approximation for nonlinear dynamics, often most accurate in the vicinity of the operating point. But let's move then on to the linear time varying models. How are these useful? Well, these are useful for studying context dependent dynamics and for developing and understanding context specific control strategies. We, they can build on um, some well-developed tools for estimating effective connectivity matrices. So for example, structural equation modeling, dynamic causal modeling, and transfer entropy. And they can take advantage of a lot of the um, uh, machinery that has been developed for linear models, but just using it in sort of a piecewise linear manner. What about nonlinear models? So these are particularly helpful for scenarios when whole sectors of the state space are prohibited. So for example, not physiologically possible. And if you're interested in this um, approach and sort of an understanding of the accessible and non-accessible spaces of a dynamical system, I would highly recommend this paper from Cornelius et al. published in Nature Communications in 2013. Now I want to ask the question of what if you have a lot of data from your system? Does that help you ch either choose which model to use or develop a new model? So if you have a lot of data, particularly stimulation data, then you can perform indirect predictive control using systems identification. Um, or you can use what's called direct predictive control. So how are those two different from one another? So first, indirect predictive control uses the data to fit a relatively low dimensional model, which you can then use in the control framework. In contrast, direct predictive control skips the fitting of the model altogether and simply uses the raw data inside of the control framework. And if you're unsure which of these approaches might be better for your particular scenario or your particular scientific question or data set, um, I recommend this wonderful paper from Vishal Krishnan and Fabio Pasqualetti um, called On Indirect, Direct versus Indirect Data-Driven Predictive Control. It really helps you to think through which of those may be most relevant for your problem. So now that we've talked about the map of the network and the model of dynamics, I want to move on to the outputs. What is the output? How do we design perturbations? So there are several different outputs. Probably the simplest one is called the impulse response. So this is where um, a system's this is a system's output when presented with a very brief input signal. So you just like ping the system and see what happens. So here's a bit of stimulation to a node that changes the activity of node I, but it also changes the activity of node J, which is connected to it. And if you um, 
uh, sum up over all of these different um, responses from all of the different nodes that provides you with the impulse response of the system. So for some models of dynamics, the impulse response can be solved analytically, um, removing the need for simulation and offering greater opportunity for mathematical intuition. The second output is a controlled response. So not just a ping to the system and see what happens, but a controlled um, response. This is the system's response to some controlling input U from some initial state X naught. For the linear system that I showed you earlier, the response will have two different components. The first will be the impulse response, so that was the, the simplest output, and then the second will be a convolution of the mapped inputs VU with the impulse response. The third kind of output that you can um, get from this approach is achieving a desired state transition. So because the map from the input to the response is known based on the model of the network and the model of the dynamics, one can design a mapped input VU to drive a desired response XT. Um, and also I would note that there are many solutions that could drive that desired response. So it's interesting to think about which of those solutions may be relevant for the brain and what constraints may help the brain determine which to use. The fourth output is the controllability. So what is the controllability? Well, a system is controllable if there is a control input that brings our system from any initial state to any final state in finite time. And if you're interested in only a subset of initial versus final states, then you might study the associated control strategies like the average controllability or the modal controllability. Um, now I want to talk uh, about the minimal energy control. And here is where we would design a control input, U of T, that would minimize the control energy and possibly some other factors to drive a desired response. So we're not asking, can you do anything to drive this desired response, but can you define a control input that minimizes the energy required for that transition? And the reason that that's interesting is that energy minimization is, an, is a common biological constraint, so something that the brain may be using anyway very frequently um, in deciding the state transitions that it engages in. Um, but also there's a clinical reason to minimize the energy um, uh, of the control so as um, not to heat the tissue, for example. So with all of those outputs, so we've talked about the inputs, we've talked about the outputs. Now I want to ask the harder question, how do you know if you've made the right choices? So as with all modeling efforts, the answer is going to depend on the scientific question. I think that there are at least three different ways that we can think about the validity of the choices that we would make for the inputs and for the outputs. The first is descriptive validity. Does the network map and or the model of dynamics match the data? If they do, then you have descriptive validity. What about explanatory validity? Do the outputs correlate with behavior, cognition, and symptoms? Does the theory provide candidate explanations of mechanism and of cause? If yes, then you have explanatory validity. And lastly, predictive validity. Does the framework predict the future response of the system to stimulation? Can it predict behavior, cognition, and symptoms? If the answer is yes, then you have predictive validity. Now, before closing, I wanted to mention a few recent methodological extensions that I'm particularly excited about in this space. One is moving from the control of activity to the control of functional connectivity. So not just can we um, push the brain into a particular um, state of activation, but can it be pushed and is it pushed toward a particular state of functional connectivity? Secondly, we can separately assess transient control strategies, so control strategies that are very swift um, and, and short uh, in over short time scales versus persistent control strategies, ones that have to expand over long time periods. We can also use those approaches to understand the control of different spatial scales of dynamics in the network. The third extension I want to mention is tuning the B matrix, which indicates where uh, inputs are being injected into the system, you can tune that to account for regional variation in serotonin receptor levels. And this is really exciting work from Singleton and colleagues. Fourth and finally, 
Um, I think it's particularly exciting to study brain states that are task relevant, so relevant for cognitive dynamics, such as those that are defined by beta weights of a general linear model applied to fMRI data. This is a really nice connection to um, cognitive function and understanding why that particular pattern of activation exists and how the brain got there and how it may move from one pattern of activation to another pattern of activation. The question spaces that the field is currently tackling include modeling cognitive control as a network control process. So, for example, this would include assessments of executive function and dysfunction and its development. Also relevant here are studies of the energy landscape modulation by either drug or placebo. Second open question space is using network control to better understand the functional consequences of altered brain structure in disease states. This would include studies of epilepsy, bipolar, and schizophrenia, and also relevant here are assessments of heritability of network control statistics. Third open space is using network control to better understand brain dynamics in response to tasks. So for example, studying the resting state versus visual processing, working memory, or also brain computer interface control. Also relevant here are studies probing control energy as a marker of cognitive effort. And fourth and finally, an open question space is using network control to understand brain response to stimulation. So for example, from transcranial magnetic stimulation and grid stimulation in epilepsy. Relevant here are studies designing personalized stimulation paradigms that use the um, individual's own structural connectome and their own model of dynamics. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening, um, and I'm excited to engage in the question and answer period.